and welcome to this episode of the Selling Through Partner Sales podcast, where I'm delighted to be joined by Jason Cutter. Jason, hi. Hey, Fred. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, I'm super excited. I know that we're going to have a blast. Uh, no, no matter what happens. Well, no. Well, what, what reputation <laughs> do I have on my podcast? <laughs> um, no, I, I, I'm really pleased to have you here as well, because uh, as the author of Selling with Authentic Persuasion, um, you know, I know we're already pretty much on the same page, and you know, I know listeners will love the uh, love love the subtitle, "Order Taker to Quota Breaker." Whoa! So, just tell us a little bit about the book before we jump into the PQ stuff, which uh, which I know is going to totally align with uh, with what you talk about. Yeah. So, the process of writing the book was really putting words and a framework to what I had found worked for me in sales. And then when I was leading teams, running trainings, developing programs, now as a a consultant, what I was doing for companies, um, trying to figure out what it is that I did, what was my sales process, or what did I help people with? um, That wasn't about re-engineering what people do. And here's like, here's the only way to do it, but more of a framework that can fit with anything. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it here, but everything in life is sales. So when I, I stepped back and I looked at, okay, what have I done for 18 years in sales and sales leadership, you know, what was that? And this is coming from a guy, which makes it even more interesting. And I think relatable for some people is I didn't plan on being in sales. I didn't get my first professional air quotes, professional sales job uh, until I was 27. And it was order taking at the time because it was the mortgage business in the U S in 2002. And everyone just was begging to buy houses or refinance. Um, so literally I didn't learn anything in sales then not for a couple more years after that, when I officially started. Um, and my whole approach to sales comes from a guy who was a shy, awkward, you know, late blooming bullied only child growing up as a kid to two loving parents who were both analytical as well. Uh, and they had a strong dislike and, and distrust for salespeople um, such that, you know, when I went to college to university, I actually chose marine biology and tagging sharks because sharks seem like a much better, safer way to go than dealing with people. Yet I still fell into sales. And, you know, that kind of it is the culmination of my approach because I'm not approaching it like a, a salesperson who's used to selling. I'm approaching it like a person who doesn't like sales, air quotes. So how do you persuade people instead? The cynics amongst us would say, well, tagging sharks and hanging out with them would be really, really good preparation. But uh, but, no, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but no, that's, that, that's not how professional, how professional sales is. So um well in a nutshell what's the framework what's the 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 the, the, the good bit at the middle so the big thing with authentic persuasion is it's both parts that's what i found there's a lot of people who are very authentic but don't persuade and a lot of times those fall into like an order taker category where they're really nice they're really authentic they're good at rapport building trust and they fall short on the persuasion there's a lot of people who are in Uh, focused on persuasion, but not very authentic. And we know what that feels like. It feels gross uh, and it doesn't feel well for us or for for that person probably selling. And so for authentic persuasion, those two pieces, it's about being authentic, knowing who you are. And what I found, there's a lot of people who get into sales, fall into sales, go into sales, uh, you know, on purpose or just through because life takes them there and they feel like they have to be a certain way to be successful in sales and they feel like oh i've got to be wolf of wall street boiler room i've got to be this guy that sold me a car like they think that is sales and really i wanted to break down that myth of no you be you i mean you got to bring your strengths there's things you have to do on the persuasion side but authentically you and one of the biggest things you and i know this fred is that sales is really tough and when you're amazing at sales you're still losing more times than not in the opportunities that you have right it, it, if you have 10 people you're talking to you you're never going to close all 10 of those people right so which means it's tough The authentic piece is that you have to also know why you're in sales, why you're doing it, what is important to you, what is your goal for yourself, um, because you're going to have to push through and be persistent. And I think it's really about that plus embracing your strengths. Then the 
persuasion piece is how do you move someone forward from where they're at now, which I'm sure we're going to talk about when we get to the PQ stuff. But you, you essentially what you're dealing with is if I'm trying to sell you something or if you're thinking about buying it and you haven't decided yet, you're a scared human stuck in your comfort zone that's afraid of change and looking for the safe way to go. It's just fundamentally what it is. And so my job as a sales professional is to help you find the safest path. And the authentic persuasion framework is that piece to help guide someone. Maybe it's not to buy from me. If it is, here's what I'm going to do. And here's how I'm going to get you there. Brilliant. Uh, I, I love it. It's, it's interesting. Actually, I was chatting to somebody last week and, and he, he uses the C word. He talks about closing and he's really happy with this. And he says, no, there's nothing wrong with closing. It's just a word. Again, it's your intent, it's what you're doing, but leaving somebody open, leaving them hanging, yeah, you're not helping anybody, you're not serving them. So either it's like, yes, you close, you move forward, we're working together, or actually, no, they're not for you, but you put in the right direction. Exactly what you said, but he just says, that's what closing means to me. I'm like, I wish it meant the same to <laughs> many more people. Um, but uh, no, really cool. So I think, even though you probably not come across the PQ model before we started chatting uh, a little while ago, um, it, it, what the way that you approach stuff it, it will be naturally using these things it's, it's what people who collaborate it's what people who want to partner it's what people who want to work together do so i'm i'm interested as always on this podcast in in your particular take on on the pq elements All um, right. so we always kick off with trust I mean, for me it just makes sense to start there it's the foundation for communication relationships and things so trust trust in sales how sales people can build trust your take on trust tell me jason um so I think a couple of things. One is I think the classic model and what doesn't work and what humans try to do, especially when they get into a sales role, is they try to go after the trust first. They go hard and fast at trust. So maybe a little bit of rapport. And then they think, salespeople think, trust building is me telling you how amazing I am, how great my company is, how many brands and logos I work with, my client's testimonials, my social proof, all of these amazing things about how amazing I am. And if I say these amazing things, you're going to trust me because I'm amazing. I think I'm amazing and my company thinks they're amazing and we're all amazing. So you should trust us because we're amazing. Um, and, amazing. And as, <laughs> and it's amazing, right? And so what's interesting is you're laughing, I'm laughing. People listening to this might be like, okay, you're a little dramatic and it's a little over top, but it's not. At any point, interact with somebody in sales, right? Anyone listening to this, interact with a different person in sales and see how soon in the beginning of the conversation they talk about themselves, who they are to try to build trust and verify and validate that they are amazing and trustworthy and you should trust them. For me, I don't think that works well. If we looked at relationships and courtship and dating, if you walked up to some stranger and they start immediately telling you about the house they have, the car they have, the job, the money, all these amazing things to get you to like them and trust them and, and want to do business with them, right? In a relationship, uh, that's not gonna work, but people do it in sales. So for me, I think it's a different thing. I actually put trust as the third part in what I have uh, created as an authentic persuasion pathway. I think the first thing is, is you have to build rapport. Everyone knows that. It's really easy. It's really basic. We all do it all the time. You and I did it before we hit record. We did it as soon as we hit record. You know, we're building rapport. That one's a no-brainer. We don't have to talk about that. Then the second part is I feel like the, the next step that you have to do is empathy. I call it empathy. In the sales process, it's discovery, it's questions, it's probing, it's asking. But I call it empathy because for me, when you do that with empathy, it's that I actually care about you. I'm using active listening. I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm listening to what you want. I'm trying to find out who you are, what problem you have, what goals you have, where you want to go in life, where you want to take your business, whatever that looks like. And I actually care. That's why I call it empathy, not discovery, not probing, uh, because those are, I'm doing this to you for my potential goals, right? On my path. Instead, empathy is, I care about you. I want to know. And then if I can help you, great. And if I can't help you, I'll let you know. Um, and to me, here's what's interesting is when you do those two things, rapport plus the empathy step at its fullest and actually listen when the other person's talking and make it about them, they will trust you. They will feel like you care and they will actually trust you and do this as an experiment. Because again, people think, oh, that doesn't work in sales. Yes, it does. And it works in life. Like have a conversation with someone in your life Ask questions, 
Don't one up. Don't respond with anything about yourself. Actually listen to what they say. Go as deep as you can with anybody, you, even at the grocery store. It doesn't matter. They will trust you. They will like you. They will feel like you care. And then they'll trust you. And then if it's in a business setting, that's when you then throw in the stuff about yourself and your business and your logos, but not until, to me, the third part of a conversation. So there's your long answer on trust. Oh, is, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure there is a short answer on trust. I don't, I don't think you can tweet it. Tell me about trust in a tweet. Mm, well, sure I think that the people who have a short answer say, oh, you just tell people to trust you and you just tell them all about how great you are and how, how amazing you yeah. are. That's, that's what people try to do. And the yeah. logos. I, mean, I, I often say yeah. to people, they say, oh, do you want to see our presentation? And I go, <laughs> does it have a map of the world with little dots all over it and uh, like slide loads of logos on in the first five? They went, yeah, it does. How do you know? And I went, okay, right, I just guessed. And uh, no, I don't need to see it now. You, you pretty much told me. I know what we need to do. <laughs> yeah, and that's uh, the classic model, right? Like yeah, that's what people yeah. think is if I show you the dots of all of our customers and the logos, or if they're B2C, I'm going to show you all the other great things that we've done for other customers like yourself, then that's going to build trust. And that's not that that's wrong. It's the placement in my experience of yeah. when to put that in the conversation, not the thing. It's where you put the thing. Totally when we put it. Um, but as you say, yeah, actually care, actually listening. Not, I've got this spreadsheet, I've got this tech list, I've got these things that I've been told I've got to ask, but I've got to do a demo, really. I want to do a demo, I want to talk about me. It's a good bit. Oh, yeah. Too much of that. Right, okay, so then let's have a think about another element of PQ, which is having this win-win focus. Yeah, Win-win in sales. Talk to me about that. <laughs> so it's interesting because when I hear that, I think of like many different things. That's as you could probably tell, my answer might be long ish. Um, you know, for me, I think one of the, the issues when we're talking about, you know, your PQ framework, my authentic persuasion mode, sales in general, selling is the classic sales, which is the dirty word. When people say, oh, I'm not a salesperson, I don't, I don't want to call myself a salesperson because that's gross, or I don't want to go into sales because sales is gross, right? So if we use the, what everyone feels is the dirty word of sales, it's because that is win-lose. That's I'm going to win, you're going to lose, or it's win blank, which is I'm going to win. I don't really care what happens to you, right? <laughs> you might win, you might lose. You might get ahead. You might not. I don't care. I have a quota. It's the end of the quarter. I don't really care what happens to you. Right. Um, and if you've ever run an organization, not just been a salesperson, then, you know, because salespeople will make these sales. And then after the fact, they cancel, they claw back, they don't onboard, they don't ever respond. And so that's when it's win lose mode. I think the other thing and the other end I'll, I'll say before I answer it is, and this is why the subtitle of my book is transform from order taker to quota breaker. Cause there's a lot of people who go so far to the other extreme with sales is they don't want to be that person who's dirty and gross. They go to the other extreme, which is lose win, which is, I just want you to win. And I want you to like me so much that if I lose, it's okay. Which is, oh, uh, the, the, for you to buy, you need a giant discount. Okay, here's a giant discount. I don't make my quota. I don't make my numbers. I might get fired next week. I want you to win though. As long as you're happy, I don't care, right? And we see that all the time. You're, you're laughing. I, you know, it, it's one of those things where we see that. And I feel like there's a place in the middle, obviously, as you do as well, which is being a professional, looking at it win-win, which is I'm going to win as a result of helping you win right? Like me helping you get what you want, either out of pain or achieving a goal or something you want or something fun or an adventure or an experience, right? Because I deal with business to consumer, business to business. It doesn't, it's all the same is I'm go. I want to win as a result of helping you win. When you're winning, I'm going to win, right? And it's really the biggest quote that I've lived by for the longest time is Zig Ziglar is you'll get everything you want in life when you help enough other people get what they want in life. Right. So if I help you win, I will win. And a real sales professional understands that if I help you win and there's value in it, then I should get paid and I should get paid relative to that value and I can get paid really well. Brilliant. So, and it's about how we have those discussions, which relates back to what you're talking about, how we build trust, because we're actually genuinely listening, we're understanding what stuff means to them. And it takes us into the next element. I mean, these are all linked up anyway, but it's interdependence. I mean, I think you actually, it was a long answer, but you've given answer to two parts, if you like, because <laughs> a, a good salesperson needs to be comfortable with interdependence, not independence. 
So again, you can give me a longer answer if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think for, for interdependence, I think one of the big things is setting the right expectation and being on the journey with someone together. Like if we're talking about the interdependence between myself, the salesperson, and you, the potential customer, like I, I'm on this with you together. And there's a couple of big things. And now that, now that you mentioned, I think a long answer is going to come. But um, one is that, you know, I think the first part is setting the expectations, which is what a lot of salespeople don't do and they're afraid of. They're afraid of calling a spade a spade, as the saying goes, or just calling it what it is, which is if this works out well, I'm going to sell you on this thing, or I'm going to help you enroll as a client. Um, a lot of people feel that to be successful in sales, because I've seen this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in various industries, in various countries, because I've worked with call centers all over, um, people don't want to call it sales because they're afraid if they say, I'm, if this goes well, I'm going to sell you, then the customers, the potential customers walls are going to stay up. And then they're going to have to overcome it. And, and no one trusts salespeople, right? Going back to the dirty part. Um, and so a lot of people are afraid of it versus a sales professional, which is going to say, hey, Fred, so what I want to do next is I want to ask you a bunch of questions. I really want to get to know you and your situation. And based on what you tell me, I will let you know if what I have and what our company does would be of value to you and help you. And if it doesn't, I'll let you know as, as well and maybe give you some advice on where else to go or maybe don't buy anything at all, right? Does that sound fair? Okay, good. And setting that expectation, which is if this works out and then you get done with your process and you go, okay, based on what you told me, this is gonna be a good fit for you. We should move forward, like, let's go. Like we're on this journey together. Um, so I think that's important. And here's the other part with interdependence. I've been talking a lot about uh, in the last few months and the speaking that I do when, when conferences or companies hire me to come speak to their teams. One of the biggest things that I'm helping people shift their mindset on is that a lot of people in sales fundamentally, naturally believe that they are the hero. And it's part of the human condition. So part of, part of the human condition is that we all think we're the center of the universe. We all think we're the hero of our own story, right? When you go to the grocery store, you're, we're all in our own heads, but we think we're the hero in the grocery store and everything evolves around us, right? Like in some parts of our life, we're really just an extra in the background of a, of a more fun movie, but we all think we're literally the hero. Here's the challenge is in any great story, any great thing, and you and I talked about this in, in prep of, of this conversation, right? Pick any hero's journey movie, Star Wars, Harry Potter, anything like that. There's never more than one hero. Now there's some sidekicks, some people who they wish they were a hero, but they don't have the skills, but there's one hero. The problem is, is that there's another person usually in those movies who also thinks they're a hero and in the hero's mind and the way the story's written is they're the villain right? Is there's Luke. And then there's the other guy who thinks he's a hero. That's Darth Vader. And so the problem is, is a lot of salespeople think they're the hero. That's why I was harping on the trust thing earlier. The customer also thinks they're the hero because they think everything revolves around them. And then that's where the battle ensues. So the thing is, when we talk about interdependence, for me, what I hear when I think of that is the fact that salespeople are the guide. Salespeople are the Yoda. Salespeople are, you know, Dumbledore. They're not <laughs> the hero. You got to make the customer the hero. And then it's you and the customer walking together up the mountain safely to the finish line. Love it. Uh, I mean, we did, we chat about this and I, I love the hero's journey. It, ju it just makes total sense to me. Um, so yeah, you're not the hero. The customer is put them at the center of the story, tell them stories about them with them in it. They will love it. People like stories. And tell, and tell them stories about other heroes you have helped up the mountain, not from your perspective of how amazing you are, but Hey, I worked with this other person and here's what happened right? Which I've always done even before I realized this, but it's like not about how I, I've done all these amazing things. It's here's someone else who was a hero like you. I helped them get to here. They made it safely and they were successful. And now I want to help you, right? And make it all about you. Yeah, totally on that. Well, we, we've got to be careful. We could now be on a like four hour podcast just talk about storytelling and heroes journeys and, and the rest of it. But um, no, no, I, I, I love that. I love that. Um, 
And I'm also thinking about being a hero in a grocery store. I'm thinking about coming back to my wife going, look at me. I bought a <laughs> yeah, packet exactly. of cornflakes. Well done me. And she'd be like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, whatever. Yeah. No, so another element then um, that, that the PQ, the PQ model gives us is uh, I, I call it transparency now. Now, originally, Steve Dent, when he put the whole thing together, he talked about self-disclosure and feedback. So giving bits about yourself um, and also being able to give feedback to people. So mm -hmm. for me, that's that kind of the shorter word is transparency. So, yeah. Yeah. Again, interesting. Your thoughts on this? Yeah. So it, what's interesting, too, is from the time I started writing the book to it coming out and the people I talked to during and then even after I had one guy on my podcast who was like, I hate the word authenticity. Mostly he hated it and really despised it because it's so overused as a buzzword, especially in the US, especially over the last two years, not even pandemic mode, but even prior to the pandemic, where it's all about being authentic, right? And he's like, I just can't stand that buzzword. I hate it. And I was like, this is going to be fun. Then you should come on my show called the Authentic Persuasion Show. This is going to be fun. <laughs> and so, and, but I knew what he really meant. And that's why I want, it was, you know, it wasn't a debate and a battle. It was really just a different perspective and using words. Some people really don't like the word persuasion. I'm like, well, look at the definition and you can look it up and, and choose. Um, but his big thing was transparency. And I really loved his approach and I really loved what he said. And it's something that resonated with me. And I could have had four different titles for this book if I chose any various words. But um, it's the fact that with him, transparency was, you know what you're gonna get. There's no surprise. There's no mystery. You get what you get. And this is what I've always prided myself on too, is that the person you meet in X situation is also the same person you'll meet over here, which is the same person you'll talk to over here. Sometimes what people do is they try to go into business mode and they're like, all right, I'm business Jason. And I've got to act like business Jason. And I do business Jason things. And I say these things. And then, you know, it's like, if you remember ever being in school and you had a teacher and then you saw your teacher, like in the grocery store or at a park or something else, and it really weird, you're like, that's really weird. Maybe they're swearing or they're saying something or yelling at their kids or doing whatever. It's like, that doesn't fit like this is this weird super weird um and i think that transparency is just being who you are and i think that's really important especially if you're in sales because like they say the truth is always easier to remember than a lie and so when salespeople are trying not just lying in what they're saying but pretending to be somebody that's why the authentic piece is so important to me when somebody in sales is trying to pretend to be a salesperson or pretend to be this person or try to pretend to be a storyteller or charismatic or funny or analytical and that's not who they are it's hard to sustain and it's hard to go in and out of that mode versus transparency, right? It's one of the biggest things I teach. I am a very analytical person by default. I want to look at facts and figures and give people solutions based on data and facts and figures. There's other people who want to sell based on going to happy hour and having fun and golfing and closing deals that way, right? You've got to be you as long as it works with your customers, right? Not everyone's going to resonate with that, but you've got to be you and not try to change. If I try to go into happy hour sales mode or golfing sales mode, it's not going to work for me because it's not, it's not my pure mode. Um, and here's the other bit that I think is more important for, you know, for what you talk about and what I talk about too, is you've got to always remember, like it's not business to consumer, right? There's these labels, B to C, B to B, business to consumer, business to business, enterprise sales, mid-market, blah, blah. None of that matters because at the end of the day, it's H to H. It's human to human. No matter what you're selling, you can sell it to, you could sell something to IBM. I don't know how many tens of thousands, hundred thousand employees they have. The person you're dealing with is a human. They have feelings, fears, hopes, goals, dreams, issues, right? You're dealing with that person. What they want is for you to be real and transparent and authentic because um, they're going to resonate with that. And they want to deal with somebody who they know, like, and trust, like Bob Berg says. So when, when somebody flexes behavior, would you say that that is being inauthentic or that actually that's, that's pretty cool. That's being kind. That's just meeting someone on their level. That's more comfortable for them. And you've done a decent thing there. So when you mean flex behavior, you mean like kind of either mirroring or adjusting or becoming more of what the other person wants? Yeah, becoming a bit more like that. So if I was working with you, you're analytical. Yeah. That is the opposite to me. So I would say, well, actually, because Jason's like that, I know I'm going to have to slow down a little bit. I'm going to have to give him some data. Yeah, I'm going to have to take longer. 
he will give me a longer answer. That's cool. Yeah. The, <laughs> no, it's cool because it's a podcast. It'd be rubbish if you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's but I can recognize that. Or I say a, a seller can recognize that and go, because the person is like that, I'm gonna do the kind thing. I'm just gonna just shift a little bit what I say and what I do. I'm not gonna change me, mm-hmm. but I'll change what I say and what I do because it'll be better for them. They'll feel more comfortable. Yeah. Is that I, so though? in that <laughs> mode, which is what I actually, I have in the book in selling with authentic persuasion, I talk about that. And, and that's one of the biggest things that I see most order taker salespeople, ineffective, unsuccessful salespeople struggle with is because they forget that not everyone is like them. Again, this goes back to that hero's mode and the fact that we're the center of our own universe. A lot of people just think everyone sees the world that the way they do, right? That everyone, that's the st- uh, struggle I had when I first started. I thought everyone loves spreadsheets. So I would literally give a spreadsheet with 10 options to customers. And then I didn't realize at the time, but I could think back and see like the glazed look in their eyes. And they're like, okay, well, let us think about it and get back to you. And then I would never hear from them again. And my boss at the time was like, how do you keep not converting these appointments into like more like applications? Like what's wrong? He sat in and he's like, Oh, don't do that. No. And, and my buying mode, I was selling like I like to buy. So I was giving myself lots of options to make it safe with no pressure because I don't like pressure when I'm a buyer. And so I was doing that. And that really ruins people's sales careers, even on the other side, which is, hey, everyone should just want to have fun. And they sell someone like me in that mode. And that's not going to work. So I think there's always a way to be authentic. It's still you and you're catering to the other person and you're guiding them forward. I think where it becomes inauthentic is if you said to me, I love facts and figures. So this is great because I have all these things and I I love it. And I can't wait to talk to you about all these things, right? Like, don't say that if it's not true, but you can say, hey, I can tell this is important to you. So let me give you some data around this to help you with this decision. That's different, right? And same thing for me. I just leave all the stats at the door if I talk to someone like you, because you don't care. You want to know how is it fun and what is everyone else doing? And then I'll hit you with you know, the FOMO, fear of missing out, so that you feel like you're missing out on something fun if you don't sign up. Uh, and then we'll go that way, right? And then say, actually, we need to tweak it to mean that actually, this is innovative. You'll be the first person to do this. Oh, bang, you're in. Yes, okay. <laughs> Either one, right? It depends on, it depends oh. on who the person is. They want to be the first one. Or do they want to be not left out? Oh, we'll definitely want to write a case study on you, really. Or oh, have to get a new shirts, everything. <laughs> oh, dear. But, but I guess, I mean, again, we, we naturally see quite a cool segue this it, into, the next, um, into the next element. And again, I'm only talking these sequentially. They are all linked, you know, yeah. which, is, which is being comfortable with change. And actually, yeah. we talk about little changes there and just shifting the way we, we do stuff. But again, you know, comfort with change is, is a key part of partnering skills. So what, what, yeah, we're starting to talk about it again, expand with your answer, Jason. <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> which part should we tackle the, the salesperson's comfort for change or the potential customer slash partner slash client comfort for change? That's why I asked the question the way I do to see which way you answer it. <laughs> well, but of course you're going to answer both because the answer is both <laughs> the answer is both so i think the, the one of the biggest things and again this is what i talked about in the book when i talked about the the traits for successful salespeople because really there's always this debate which is nature versus nurture there's natural born salespeople who could sell you know sand in the desert and i'm like well that's dumb and that's manipulative why would you sell sand or sell water in the desert? like well, that's easy like well i don't get i don't like those analogies and i don't think most people do um but i don't think there's a such thing as a natural born salesperson there's just some personalities that help but the first the the two traits that I put at the top of the list for anybody to be successful in sales, whether it's natural or they work, had to work on it like I did, is open and openness and curiosity. Like it's those two things. And the openness is really about new ideas, but also to change and where things are going to feedback from a boss or from clients or listening to their own calls. But it's that ability to change and adapt and go. Like if somebody has a fixed mindset as a salesperson and they're inflexible, they will really struggle because they'll think everything has to be the same way. So you've got to be careful because sometimes what happens is salespeople chase too many things and don't treat it like an experiment, like a professional. And they change too many things. Oh, I made this one call. I left this one voicemail. So let me try a different one next. 
Oh, now let me try a different one next. And then if it works, you have no idea why, because you're not treating it like a science experiment, like a professional. It's like, okay, let me try this thing. But you've got to be, you got to have a high level of comfort with change in a growth mindset with wanting to win and exceed because you, you never know enough. I mean, I'm always reading. I even, I still constantly read sales books, persuasion books. I'm listening to things. I'm picking up things like, oh, that makes sense. Um, so I think that's, that's one side. I mean, uh, to be successful in life, you have to have some comfort with change in the areas of personal development, mindsets, professional development. Um, and then I think when we get to the customer side, the potential customer, the partner, the client, that is even bigger of a challenge because, and, and this is part of the model I, I created, the authentic persuasion pathway, which is it starts with somebody's comfort zone. This is your potential customer who's not a customer yet or not a partner or whatever. They're in this comfort zone in the heart center, comfortable, cozy in the middle, and then danger is all outside of their comfort zone. And of course, for me and my model, I have shark, you know, uh, shark fins in there because, you know, that's scary and it's me, but, you know, outside of it is all the scary stuff. And the reason I know this is that people are literally the number one fear that your customers have more than anything else is the fear of change. Now there's the fear of change is triggering different things and we won't get into all of that, but the number one thing that they're all afraid of is change. And the reason why I can say that hundred percent of the time and guarantee it and promise it and back it up every single time is that if they had no fear, of change, when they spoke to you, salesperson, they would have said, hey, I know what you guys do. I'm interested in this. Here's my money. Let me know how I sign up. That means they have no fear of change because they're ready. They're outside of their comfort zone and they're totally cool with it. If they need to talk to you, a salesperson, which we've already stated, and most people agree, is a scary experience because who knows what you're going to do with your win-lose attitude based on their bad experiences they've had before as a customer, right? That's, they're, they're literally risking terrible things that salespeople do to them to try to get help. That's because they're stuck inside their comfort zone, but they know there might be something good outside. Your number one job, all your job is to do as a salesperson is to move them out of their comfort zone safely in a way that feels safe to them. And I actually, Fred, I created an acronym for SAFE, S-A-F-E, like capital letters, successful at fear elimination. That's, that's what I tell salespeople their job is, to make people feel safe. Because when you do that, they're ready to buy. Until you do that, they're not ready to buy. Very cool. I love an acronym. Um, no, but, and that one in particular, because that, that, that is dead right. And then you're talking about buyer safety and, that I mean, I'm certainly talking to quite a lot of people who, you know, we are talking more and more about buyer safety. And this is something that, you know, a good salesperson won't just do for the sake of it. Actually, I'm not sure you can anyway, but it's if that is your mindset, if that's your ethos, you know, it's like the authenticity, it's like the you know, partnering skills. It's if that is what's guiding you, you are going to be a, I say, a better salesperson, you'll be a better person. <laughs> um, so, yeah. yeah, I know that. I, I like that. And then again, recognize you know, coming out of a comfort zone, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And salespeople yeah. aren't and, always and, doing and, it themselves, by the way. <laughs> no, <laughs> they're not. They're customers and, to do it, but they won't do it themselves. Mm, well, that's and that's what happens a lot of times too, is I see that people are in sales. If they've been in sales for a, a while, and a while is relative. I've seen some people fall into this within weeks. I've seen it take months for other people. Is what happens is they get desensitized to the struggles happening in the non-customer's head, right? Whatever that, whatever industry, again, this is, it's all the same. Literally, it's all the same. It doesn't matter. Like what, what you're selling and who you're selling it to, how long your sales cycle is, it doesn't matter. It's human to human. And so see salespeople who are desensitized. They think everybody should love this. Everyone should want this. Or I've heard all the objections and now I'm just gonna give you lectures because you're either gonna want it or you're not. And if you don't, then you're stupid. And like, I've heard all of these things from salespeople, like after the fact, when they don't close deals and they just forget that person is a human who is in their comfort zone and they're worried about danger and what that all might mean. And then again, there's this comfort zone thing. Your danger outside of your comfort zone is going to be different than mine as an analytical person, right? Because the danger outside of the comfort zone for an analytical person like myself is fear of looking bad, fear of making a mistake, embarrassment, screwing up, 
it's still fear of change. The fear of change is because I don't want to look bad. I don't want to pick the wrong car and then have people make fun of me, right? You don't want to pick the wrong car and not be cool or like other people or trendsetter or, you know, everyone else has a Tesla. I used to live in California. So if everyone else has a Tesla, if you don't have a Tesla, you're a loser. So you better go buy a Tesla. And so, but overall, it's a fear of change. And then there's some fundamental, deep, deep stuff under there. Yeah. Uh, that, that's cool and and so yeah we move on to, to, to the last element um which is having this future orientation which again we do, we're, we're touching on these just as we're, we're moving into them so i'm just saying okay well let's go deep on it tell me tell me a bit more <laughs> about the the future orientation that you know a salesperson or somebody who's selling using partnering skills will will need yeah so i think that's the biggest thing right is is what your non-customers, I'm going to say some people like prospects, some people like leads. They're not a customer yet. They're not a client yet. Whatever that bucket, they have not given you money for something yet. Their biggest fear is change. And their biggest thing they're looking for is safety with that change, but then also hope. The biggest thing they're coming to you for is a solution. But before that solution, it's really the hope. And it's about that hope coming to you. So in my authentic persuasion pathway, I actually have five steps, rapport, empathy, trust. So we talked about all those and then hope. And then hope is that future orientation, future casting, which is, okay, Fred, based on what you told me when I asked you a bunch of questions, here's what I think is the best process, or I have this, here's how this is going to help you achieve your goal or get out of pain or get what you want, right? Here's you in the future and here's what this is going to look like. And here's how this is going to help you get there. And the key with that is a lot of people in sales do this future orientation, hope, solution part as a blanket because they have fallen in love and their company has fallen in love with what they sell or created. And they think everyone should just want it. And so they just treat everyone the same. The challenge is, is, again, everyone thinks they're their own hero and center of their own universe. So you always have to make that future about themselves. Even if you're selling the same thing that everyone buys and uses in the same way, you still have to make it about that person so they can see it. Because if they can see it, then they're willing and they see that it will help them, then they will break through that comfort zone. And, and that's, again, that pathway to help them get out of that and then embrace change is it's got to be about that future. And the more emotional you can make that future, the more impactful, the, impactful, the more valuable, the, the easier it will be to close air quotes, which I, I, we could, we could debate and, and, and uh, talk about closing versus not closing. Um, but uh, you know, the more you make it about that. And again, if you're selling enterprise level software to a giant company, it, it it's still, you're dealing with that person. So that person has to be the champion or get the money for it or write the check for it or get the approval, like whatever it is. So the more they're bought in for their future and what that means and that the other future is better because here's the big thing. And this is where most people, they, they don't make the tie-in is we like our comfort zone for a reason. The reason is because as a species, homo sapiens, we've dominated this planet for two reasons, right? One is we care about ourselves and we're really good at our own survival and being really self-centered and selfish as an individual to keep ourselves alive. And funny enough, we've actually done really well marrying that with being a tribal society, working together and being successful over the elements, over other animals, over wherever we want to go and do, we as a species will work together and dominate for good and for evil, right? We do lots of bad stuff to lots of bad places or good places. Um, and so the thing is, is that that's what our mind does. Um, and so there's that safety and it takes a lot for a primal part of our brain to go, you know what, I'm going to move to a brand new city and start a new life and try something completely new, right? It better have a whole lot of hope or right where I'm standing better be literally on fire and so painful, I have to jump. And so salespeople are up against that, up against a primal part that's been around for whatever you believe, hundreds of thousands, millions of years that doesn't like change. And it better really love the idea of what the other option is. And if you can do that, then it's really not even about closing. Then you don't have to close anything if people are that on board. Love it. So rapport, empathy, trust, hope. What was the yeah. last element? 
So the fifth one, which probably is a whole nother episode is urgency. Uh, and really it's not, it, it's really the easiest one. The urgency is that time is always now. Whatever you're dealing with, even if it's a long sales cycle, every conversation is its own sales process, but the time is always now. Because if you don't put that urgency on it, people will put their head back in the sand and make no decision because they'll go back into their comfort zone. Now, here's the problem is most people in sales that we don't like, the gross side, is they start off with urgency or they push urgency and they everyone feels like urgency is the problem, right? Like, well, like Fred, what is it going to take for you to buy a car instead of walking off the lot today, right? Like, hey, Fred, it's the end of the quarter. What's it going to take for you to buy today? Like, that's gross. We don't like it. It's manipulation. It doesn't feel good. The urgency is not the problem. If you know all of the information up to that part, then the rest of it is just paperwork. It's just admin, right? Um, it's not about like, okay, you need to do this now. It's I've already determined. I'm a professional. I found your issue. I have the solution. We both agree. Go ahead and grab your credit card. The next step is uh, getting you set up. It's not, would you like to buy? I'm, you know, the doctor doesn't say, would you like to have the brain surgery because we found you have a tumor? The doctor says, you need to make an appointment and we need to get you in this afternoon, right? Yeah. That doesn't feel gross. Why? Because they're a professional. They went through their process and did a diagnosis and got a prescription and said, here is your problem. We need to fix this now. But they don't say, here's a brochure. Here's my business card. Is this something you'd like to do? Hey, if you sign up for brain surgery by the end of the quarter, we're doing, we do 10% off. Like, I'll, you know, I'll give you, a, I don't know, a, a free arm cast. If you, you know, it's like, no, like they don't, but it doesn't feel gross from then. So you have to act like a professional. I took photos of all the brains that I've done in the past. <laughs> all, the, all the brains, all the logos of all the brains they've done, right? Like it's, it's not, I mean, they have other things to build the trust, yeah. but they handle in a different way. And if you sell, I, I teach a course called Persuading Like a Professional. And I literally take the analogy of how doctors function in, a, a, you know, an exam room and when they're doing what they do. And if you did that as a salesperson, it's a totally different game because now you're not pushing somebody. Now you're pulling them to the solution yeah and it's the old prescription without diagnosis is more practice type thing. yeah and that, so, that's in that's in my book that's a yeah. chapter in the book we you know a lot of salespeople just think their job is to just push push yeah. pills all yeah. the time and instead it's about helping people brilliant love it God, time has flown it, it really <laughs> has no it really has and um, um you can see i'm scribbling things down here i've actually got a new hope written <laughs> and Perfect. circled in big letters and i keep going back and circling it because you keep talking about star wars and then hope and i'm like circling all that so last question really serious one you know because of course you're a guide so you're not gonna be luke yeah who are you in star wars then <laughs> i i feel like i'm more of an ob1 although i know he dies but then he comes back as a ghost i think uh you know definitely definitely more of that like i've seen a lot of things uh for, for sure more of that, more of Dumbledore, more of a more of a teacher and a guide. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. Lots of really useful stuff. I mean, I really appreciate you sharing all that and then sharing the model. And I knew there would be so much in in common with what we uh, what we both do because uh, well, it's the stuff that works, isn't it? So you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, brilliant. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, best things is. Um, if you want a copy of this book, it's available on Amazon. Depending on where you're at, that might be easier. Uh, I do sell them directly, but I have them hard copy. There's also Kindle, and then there's an Audible version that's on Amazon of Selling with Authentic Persuasion. Uh, you can also buy it directly from me. So if you go to jasoncutter.com, that's actually a hub for everything I do from the training and the coaching to the book. And I have a couple other books available to my podcast. Uh, and if any of this resonates, have any questions or want any ideas about this, or want to talk more about you or your, your sales team, uh, my email is jason at cuttercontultinggroup.com. Brilliant. jasoncutter.com. Sounds like everything will be there. We'll be able to get all the links to it. Um, so brilliant. No, thank you so much, Jason. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed listening to it. A lot, lot of sense in there and a lot, a lot of learning points. Well, thank you for having me. And I love the framework that you have. I mean, even without us, practicing this or putting any you know like frame just using your process which again you you know resonates well like i love that i mean people listening to this can take what you 
focus on what I added to it and, and some little gems that I, you know, threw in there. Um, I think that really shifts the way people sell. And I appreciate that you're doing this kind of podcast to get people to sell in a different way that doesn't feel gross. So we can shift the way that, you know, consumers see sales professionals. Yeah, totally. Brilliant. Thanks, Jason.